You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. To the Gil Martin Show with your host, Gil Martin. Author and columnist Gil Martin gives in depth analysis on all sports as he goes beyond the score. Let Gil show you why things happen both on and off the field. Now, please welcome your host, Gil Martin. And welcome, everybody, to the Gil Martin Show. Hope everybody is staying safe and staying well in these difficult times. Great to be with you here on this Saturday morning on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio as we discuss everything happening in the world of sports. And finally, for the first time in about a month, maybe more, we actually have major live an event to discuss as the NFL draft. We are two days in. Today we'll wrap up the draft with rounds four through seven and certainly for sports fans starved for content and activity, this has been a, a, a godsend in a lot of ways, giving us something to talk about, something live, something that, you know, quite frankly, there's a lot of sports available on TV and streaming services and networks and all that, but we already know who won all the games they're showing, so... At least now we don't know what's going to happen next. And it it, it is part of what I think has slowly but surely begun to happen. And it is encouraging. Just over the last week or so, we're starting to see a slight change in the tone of the discussion that the different leagues, commissioners, uh, and and owners of the teams are having. And yes, we are still at least a month, maybe more, away from resuming the basketball and hockey seasons and getting the baseball season underway. At most, uh, you know, it'll be at least a month. But we're starting to see a change in the tone of the discussion. Instead of constantly worrying about shutting things down. Now the discussion has turned to how and when can we safely start things back up? It's a subtle change. It is, again, nothing is imminent right now. We still need to have more testing. We still need to have more, uh, more safety. We need to have a plan, a location, there needs to be travel. There are a lot of factors that still have to be worked out before sports can resume. And it is very likely, very, very likely that when sports does begin to resume, we're talking about games being played in empty stadiums, empty arenas. Uh, You know, the, the only people there will be the players, the coaches, the training staffs, the referees, uh, and, and whatever television crew is necessary to broadcast the games, but it does look increasingly like the discussion is turning toward how do we resume and when is it safe to resume? So hopefully we're inching in that direction. And you, you've you heard different leagues talk about different plans. Major League Baseball has floated the idea of playing games at spring training sites, knowing that Teams in California, teams in New York, for example, especially, uh, will have difficulty hosting games for the foreseeable future. So 
Maybe instead, you you know, the leagues have talked about playing games in Florida and Arizona at teams spring training facilities that at least puts the teams in closer proximity to each other. You can isolate the teams. The stadiums that they play in tend to be minor league stadiums, and you can move on from there. The National Hockey League, for example, has floated the idea of playing. First, they looked at neutral sites, and I know we talked about that on last week's show. They were talking about North Dakota and New Hampshire and Saskatoon, Saskatchewan as three possible places that had uh, low population density, fewer cases of COVID-19 in that area, good facilities because there are colleges or minor league teams that play there, and maybe they'd be interested in hosting. Since then, the logistics of that have been viewed as not that easy to work out. And now the NHL is talking about having one team from each division possibly host all the games that are going to be played in that division. So, for example, in the Metropolitan Division, the discussion has been that at Raleigh, the Carolina Hurricanes could be the host team. For the Midwest Division, they were looking at the Minnesota Wild as the most likely team to be able to host the, uh, you know, seven teams or eight teams in that division and, and, and whatever games they would have to play. So they were looking now in the NHL at four possible locations, one from each division, and you play your games that way. Golf has talked about resuming sometime in June, again, most likely without spectators, but the PGA Tour will eventually continue and hopefully they find a way to do it safely. There are still obstacles, obviously, out there. And one of them may be simply this, and it's not necessarily the easiest thing to overcome, but again, I'm sure they'll find a way. Right now, we do not have adequate testing to determine, you know, who does or does not have coronavirus, who has immunity and all of that. We don't have enough tests. We're working on it, but we don't, as a nation, have enough tests for everybody to be tested before they return to work and then before, you know, they know that they have some sort of immunity. Would sports get a lot of resentment from people if they take those limited number of tests and use them to test millionaire athletes so they can entertain people when other people can't go to work and can't feel safe because they can't get tests for themselves and their loved ones. So, You know, these are all some of the obstacles that need to be worked out, overcome, figured out. There are logistical issues as well as far as hotels and and isolation and practicing and coaching and uh, getting the players back in one place and having them all be safe. So. There is still a lot that needs to be done, but we've seen the NFL and the WNBA hold their drafts. We have heard discussions about how baseball and hockey and basketball are looking at different ways to resume play. It will happen. Now, it may be quite some time before you can go with your family to the ballpark and sit down in the crowd and have some hot dogs and uh, beer and whatever else it is that you want to eat or drink at a game and sit in the sun and watch, you know, your favorite baseball team this summer. That may or may not be able to happen, but it is looking increasingly likely that we will have sports again in a relatively short amount of time. And for sports fans, That is certainly encouraging news overall because we've now been, oh, about five or six weeks without any live 
sporting events. And no, I don't count the WWE. No, no offense to wrestling fans. Let's face it. When you know the outcome of the event beforehand, or at least when the people involved in it do, it's a show. It's not a sport. So we're going to see live sports again. It will take some more time, but at least the thinking is shifting toward how do we get started again rather than what are we doing to shut everything down. We have got a lot to talk about. Two rounds of the NFL draft in the books will break down some of the winners, the losers, the observations from what this draft was like. All that and a whole lot more still to come on The Gil Martin Show. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back to the Gil Martin Show. Great to be with you here on TuneIn Radio and the BBM Global Network. And look, the NFL draft started Thursday night, continued last night with rounds two and three, but Look, here is the bottom line. It was wonderful as a sports fan to see some kind of a live event. And the NFL draft, it was surreal in a lot of ways, but it was also pretty wonderful just to have the draft held. The NFL could not draft in Las Vegas live as they were hoping to do. And certainly, you know, they announced that Las Vegas will host the draft, I believe, in 2022. So at least the fans and the uh, businesses in Vegas will get a chance to host a draft when hopefully things are back to whatever normal is going to be. But here is the bottom line. This draft worked. And even though the commissioner was in his house and all the coaches and general managers were home as opposed to being in the war room, as they call it, and and having teams in one place and the players in one place. It, it changed the tone of the draft, but at the same time, it seemed very appropriate under the circumstances that we're all dealing with right now that, for example – Players were all home with their families. And that, I think, while it's always nice to see the player, you know, hug the commissioner and shake hands and come up and be recognized and do interviews and what have you, I I think it was more touching and more, it, it humanized the players more to just get a little peek into their world and see them with their 
mothers and fathers and girlfriends and friends and siblings and everybody else together gathered and anticipating the excitement of the day. I, I, I think it also made us understand that the National Football League and these executives, coaches, players, and uh, you know, athletes who many of us seem to view as larger than life are just, you know, human beings and they're all trying to cope with this coronavirus pandemic like the rest of us are. So I, I think it humanized the players and the and the executives of the league a little bit. It made it showed how we were in the same boat and kudos to the NFL. And very often I am critical of Roger Goodell and the way he handles things. But I think the league did a very nice job of raising money for charity, of recognizing the people who are on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic, the the medical workers, the people who are working in food, uh, you know, the people who are first responders, all, all of the people who are working hard and putting themselves on the front lines of this fight got recognized by the league, appreciated, made statements. It was, in that sense, also heartwarming. And the league did raise a lot of money for relief and for charity to help feed people and to help fight the the coronavirus and help medical facilities and all of that. So I think the NFL did a very good job of handling this. There were no major technical glitches. I was almost sure that at least one team would have all of a sudden, you know, the screen would go blank and someone would lose their internet connection and not be connected to uh, the television or to the team or to the league. But realistically, that did not take place. And the good thing also was, I think, the fact that there has been a paucity of sporting events, live events on TV, the NFL announced that there was a record viewership for the draft. Round one had 15.6 million viewers Thursday night. Now, that was ABC, ESPN, NFL Network, some digital channels, and ESPN Deportes. But 15.6 million viewers is a 37% increase over last year when they had 11.4 million viewers. And the all-time record was set back in 2014 when there were 12.4 million viewers. So an average audience of 15.6 million, the high point came between 8.45 and 9 at night, so roughly 45 minutes to an hour after the draft got underway, when 19.6 million people tuned in, and that was largely to see the first, you know, two or three picks, including quarterback Joe Burrow from LSU, who went to the Cincinnati Bengals with the first pick. And before the draft, the NFL had something that they called Draft-a-thon Live, which was a fundraiser for COVID-19 relief efforts. And more than 7 million viewers tuned in for that. Roger Goodell released a statement. The theme of hope is always prevalent in the NFL, especially with regard to the draft. In 2020, that's especially true as we help honor healthcare workers, first responders, and others on the front line of the battle with COVID-19, while giving our fans something to cheer about as we celebrate the next generation of NFL stars. Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and Kansas City were the top five markets viewing the NFL draft, but again, a record-setting attendance and definitely a situation where the players were humanized and we got a little peek inside the world of some of these coaches and owners and 
uh, got to see inside their homes, what, you know, what their setup was like. And I think that the NFL overall did a very good job of handling the draft under different circumstances and difficult circumstances. So to the NFL, ESPN, NFL Network, uh, all those that were handling this draft, I think they did a very good job overall. And it was just great so far to see a live sporting event take place during this difficult time. All right, let's start talking about the players and everything else. When we come back, we'll talk about winners and losers, surprises, and break down the NFL draft. More to come on The Gil Martin Show. Master of words, powerful player. What life-changing words can Dr. Janet Smith-Warfield pull out of her magical toolbox that just might mysteriously open a door you never knew was there? A door to free yourself from fear forever. Transform your rage into right action. Release your guilt. Position you into a life of freedom, purpose, passion, power, and peace. All quite suddenly, unexpectedly, and almost miraculously, with no effort on your part. Join Dr. Janet every Monday at noon Eastern on Dancing with Words, Dancing with Wisdom. On the BBM Global Network, as she and her guests show you how words map our experiences. Immersing you in a sound bath that relaxes your muscles, opens your mind, and supports you in co-creating your extraordinary life. Welcome back to the Gil Martin Show. Good to be with you here on TuneIn Radio and the BBM Global Network as we talk about everything happening in the world of sports. And uh, this week, that means the NFL Draft as uh, the 32 teams in the National Football League have spent Thursday night and Friday night going through the first three rounds of the draft. And in about 40 minutes, rounds four through seven will get underway and there'll be more than 200 new players getting ready to hopefully embark on their NFL careers. Before we get to the draft and who some of the winners and losers have been, uh, You know, one thing that didn't happen as much during this draft is player trades. Usually you see a player being sent to another team, often in exchange for a draft pick or two. And I think the reason for the lack of trades so far has been the fact that because of the shutdown due to the coronavirus, teams cannot have their team doctors examine potential players they're going to acquire. So you don't know if a player who suffered an injury a year or two ago has a clean bill of health from your own doctor before being able to make a trade. As a result, we are not seeing those trades taking place with any kind of regularity. And at the end of the day, Most of the trades that we've seen, in fact, to my knowledge, all of the trades that we've seen have been trading a draft pick for a draft pick. And I think that makes sense given the limitations that we all have uh, due to the coronavirus. Now, there was one big signing announcement just before the draft, uh, well, during the draft, actually, And that one belonged to the Houston Texans as they signed offensive tackle Laramie Tunsil to a three-year, $66 million extension. And that makes Tunsil the highest paid offensive lineman in NFL history. And how good is this contract? Well, out of the $66 million, $57.85 million is guaranteed money. Now, the old record for the highest annual average salary belonged to Lane Johnson of the Eagles. He was averaging $18 million a season uh, after signing his extension last November. 
But now Tunzel, who was acquired in a big trade from the Dolphins before the 2019 season, uh, will now be signed through 2023. And basically will be the NFL's highest lineman, at least until somebody else comes along and signs a new deal. Tunsil played in his first Pro Bowl last year. He's only 25 years old, so this deal will basically take him through the prime of his NFL career. Good news for Tunsil and certainly good news for the Houston Texans, who uh, essentially locked up their best offensive lineman for the next three seasons. All right, so let's start talking a little bit about this draft and how some of the teams did. Very few surprises very early on. The Cincinnati Bengals were on the clock first. They went with Joe Burrow quarterback out of LSU, and everybody expected that, and it really is uh, a a good move by the Bengals, doubtful that they would have had an opportunity to get a Heisman Trophy winning franchise type of quarterback. No, Look, when you have the first pick in the draft, and you need a quarterback, and most teams picking first to do because quarterback is the most important position on the field in the modern NFL. When you have a chance to draft first overall, and there are good quarterbacks out there, you relish that opportunity. And let's face it, if the Cincinnati Bengals hit on Joe Burrow and they get, you know, like A.J. Green back healthy again this year, and they've added some other pieces in the draft already, they could go from a two-win team to a nine- or ten-win team as early as this season if everything breaks right. And look, rookie quarterbacks often struggle, but what you get when you add a franchise or, or a potential franchise quarterback like Joe Burrow is you get hope. And even if, like last year, If the Bengals lost a a game and looked bad, it was same old Bengals. And, you know, fans didn't have anything to hang their hat on. But now when you have a rookie quarterback, a potential franchise quarterback starting, you say, hey, in week one, we lost and we looked bad. Now in week nine, we lost, but did you see the play that Joe Burrow made? It gives fans hope. It gives fans something to say, look at what we've got now. And look at how good this player can be. And Burrow, he will need more players around him to reach his full potential. But the Bengals are going to work on that. They've already made some moves, and Burrow was the right choice, without question, for the Cincinnati Bengals with that first overall pick. And no question about it, they did very well by taking Joe Burrow. And yeah, there is an adjustment period, always, between college and And the NFL, even a guy who played at LSU in the SEC, the highest rated conference, arguably in college football and Burrow played a lot of NCAA playoff and championship games. He's a big game experienced quarterback, but at the same time, it'll take him time to learn the NFL game. So. Give it time, be patient, but have hope, Cincinnati Bengals fans, because change has arrived. All right, we're going to continue our discussion, talk about some winners and losers from the draft so far. Some teams made some real head-scratching moves. Some teams did very well. We'll break it all down for you when we return on The Gil Martin Show. 
Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of current concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Welcome back to the Gil Martin Show here on TuneIn Radio and the BBM Global Network. Great to be with you on this Saturday morning as we break down and talk about everything happening in the world of sports. And uh, finally, we actually have some live events going on, specifically the NFL Draft. Two days in, one day to go. They'll wrap things up starting at noon Eastern time today. Probably run all the way till about 6 or 7 o'clock this evening as they do rounds 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then the rush to sign the undrafted free agents will be on. A couple of teams that I think did very well, especially on day one of this draft. The Miami Dolphins, let's start with them made some trades, and ended up with three first-round picks. And the way they maneuvered in this draft, I think, and the players that they got will really help a Miami team that is trying to rebuild and and, and get back into contention. And, And let's face it, the AFC East right now with Tom Brady no longer a New England Patriot, it's wide open. And the Buffalo Bills probably are the favorites. You can't count New England out, but Miami made themselves better with the three picks that they made in the first round of this year's draft. With the fifth overall pick, the Dolphins grabbed Tua Tagovailoa, uh, Tagovailoa excuse me, uh, of Alabama, and... They, you know, there was a lot of talk that maybe the Lions with the third pick or the Giants with the fourth pick would be making trades and some other team would come in and try to leapfrog the Dolphins and get Tua. But instead, the Dolphins stayed at five, no trades were made, and they ended up with their quarterback of the future. And look, The only concern most scouts have about Tua is his health. And, you know, he he dealt with some injuries over the last two seasons. When he's been healthy, this guy has taken Alabama to a national championship, to the playoffs, uh, the NCAA, you know, semifinals. And he has demonstrated he's got the leadership qualities, the arm strength, when healthy, the mobility. He is going to be a potential game changer for a Miami Dolphins organization that, quite honestly, has not had a long-term franchise quarterback 
since Dan Marino retired. And, you know, we're going back almost two decades when you talk about that. Then with the 18th overall pick, the pick that they acquired from the Steelers in the Minka Fitzpatrick deal, the Dolphins grabbed Austin Jackson, big, big offensive tackle out of USC. So first you get Tua, your quarterback, then you get a guy to help protect Tua, to help keep him healthy. And quite honestly, with those first two picks in that first round, the Dolphins addressed the two most important positions on the offensive side of the ball, a quarterback and an offensive tackle. So two solid picks. I like Austin Jackson very much. He's athletic. He has the uh, ability to get to the second level, to block well on sweeps, screens, to not only block linemen, but to, you know, move downfield and block linebackers or defensive backs when called upon. And I think they did a very good job of adding to the offensive line. Then they add a defensive back, a cornerback, Noah uh, Ig. Bino Gwene, I hope I pronounced that right or came close, out of Auburn, and again, addressing another one of their needs. Uh, They traded uh, to get that pick, but overall, here's a guy who was a converted receiver. He's a bit raw as far as technique goes, but he has good tools, quick feet, Speed that, you know, you want in a defensive back. And the Dolphins made themselves better in three places, three important places with those three picks. Then you have the Minnesota Vikings, another team I think that did exceptionally well in day one. First, with the 22nd overall pick, they added Justin Jefferson, the wide receiver out of LSU. And boy, did a lot of LSU players go in the first round. But Justin Jefferson is uh, an outside threat. He's fast. He, He is also, in addition to being capable of the deep pass, he's the kind of guy who can make catches over the middle as well. And they needed somebody to replace Stephon Diggs, who they had traded away to Buffalo. Then they ended up picking up an extra fourth round pick when they traded back from that pick they acquired for Diggs from the Bills. And they end up grabbing a defensive back, cornerback Jeff Gladney out of TCU. And Gladney is essentially a good pickup. He'll probably need a year, maybe two to fully reach his potential, a little bit raw in the area of technique, but he fits the team's scheme. They added a fourth and fifth round pick by trading back. We're still able to address the secondary and the Minnesota defense. The, the, the Vikings found themselves in a bad cap situation and by getting the wide receiver and defensive back to replace departed players and then adding a fourth and fifth round pick by trading back the Vikings a address their needs and b have the opportunity to pick up two more inexpensive players in the middle rounds of the draft who will be on rookie contracts for the next four years and thereby get paid less. You help your salary cap situation. And again, I think the Vikings did a very, very good job by making those two selections uh, on draft day. So Some teams have done very well, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of those teams. Other teams made some picks, and they leave you scratching your head 
We will talk about some of those controversial picks and a lot more. More to get to on the NFL Draft right here on The Gil Martin Show. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately 3.5 to 4 million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to the Gil Martin Show. Great to be with you here on TuneIn Radio and the BBM Global Network as we discuss what's happening in the world of sports. And thankfully this week there are things happening in the world of sports. So uh, great to talk about that, the NFL Draft being Front and center right now. A couple of teams made some questionable moves. We want to talk about them. One move I didn't understand all that much, the Seattle Seahawks with the 27th overall pick, taking linebacker Jordan Brooks out of Texas Tech. And, you know, first of all, Brooks... He had a a shoulder injury that required surgery in December. That certainly hurt his draft stock. The other thing is that Patrick Queen of LSU was still on the board, and almost everybody had Queen ranked higher than Brooks. Now, obviously, the Seahawks organization felt that Brooks was a better fit for what they were trying to do. The other thing is, to me, that linebacker position was not, uh, inside linebacker specifically, not one of the top needs that the Seahawks had. And I thought they would go offensive tackle. Joshua Jones, for example, was still on the board. Or an interior defensive lineman like Ross Blacklock was still on the board. I think Brooks can be a good player. But I don't think they got good value for him at this spot. I don't think that they necessarily picked a position that was a particular need. And then if they were going to pick at that position, there were better players out there for them to select. So a a little bit of a curious move by the uh, Seattle Seahawks at that spot. Then there's the moves made by the Las Vegas Raiders. And, you know, their first round pick overall was wide receiver Henry Ruggs out of Alabama. He is a typical Raiders pick. Al Davis, the longtime owner of the then Oakland Raiders, always loved speed and Ruggs is the fastest receiver in the draft. He is the kind of a guy who can make big plays down the field. Now, C.D. Lamb, 
who many scouts rated as the best value, the best receiver in a very deep receiving class, was still on the board when the Raiders picked at 12. But I understand why the Raiders went with Ruggs instead. What I don't understand, however, is why the Raiders added two more wide receivers in the third round of the draft. So, you know, I understand trying to improve a position. You load up at that position, but three receivers in the first three rounds is a bit much. Now, one of those three is likely to be moved to running back or H back. So that does maybe lessen the confusion a little bit. But overall, it really is not a move that made a lot of sense to select three receivers in such a short span of time. Ruggs is a typical Raider pick, and that makes a certain amount of sense. But overall, not logically consistent there. The other team that I am still struggling with their pick is the Green Bay Packers. They moved up from 30 to 26, gave up a fourth round pick. Here is a team that was 13 and three last year, won the NFC North, won a playoff game, went to the NFC championship game, one game away from the Super Bowl before losing to the San Francisco 49ers. They lost that game primarily because they could not stop the 49ers from running the football. They had obvious needs at wide receiver, offensive tackle, defensive line, inside linebacker, and cornerback. They also have a future Hall of Fame quarterback in Aaron Rodgers, who, even though he'll be 37 late in the coming season— still played at a Pro Bowl level, has at least three seasons left on his contract. And the thought was that you want to get weapons for Rodgers to try to put him over the hump, get one more game forward into the Super Bowl, and then possibly win it. Rodgers has already won one Super Bowl in his career. The thought was when you're that close, You go all in to help the Hall of Famer get that second ring. Instead, the Packers use that first pick, 26th overall, on Utah State quarterback Jordan Love. And I'm not saying Love doesn't have the potential to develop into a very good quarterback down the road. However, he's not going to play this season unless Rodgers gets hurt. And you have a situation in the NFL where a rookie, a first-round pick, you lock them up under that cheap rookie entry-level contract for four years with a club option on first-round picks for a fifth. If Love has to sit behind Rodgers for three years you are losing more than half of the value of that inexpensive rookie contract, which you can then use to the cap space to bring in other talented players to win with that young quarterback. We saw the LA Rams reach the Super Bowl doing just that a couple of years ago. The Seattle Seahawks did the same thing with Russell Wilson when he was under his rookie contract. They went to two Super Bowls and won one. The Packers have now lost the first three years of Love's contract under most likely scenarios, and they did not get any help for their franchise quarterback to take that last step this year. It's an interesting move I understand when you get a chance to draft someone you feel is a franchise quarterback, you don't want to pass it up. But at this time, the move really didn't make a lot of sense. And neither did a lot of other moves that the Packers made. And we'll talk about that 
and a lot more when we return. More to come to on The Gil Martin Show. There are artists and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History and the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Le Colde Beaux-Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20-year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit www.asmarart.com www.aliceasmarinternational.com and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to the Gil Martin Show. Great to be with you here on this Saturday morning talking about the world of sports. NFL draft, the biggest concern right now. It's been great to see a live sporting event taking place again. Boy, have I missed it. We were talking when we left off about the Packers and the decision to select Jordan Love, the quarterback out of Utah State. Here's the other aspect of it. In addition to not getting help at the positions they need to take that last step and maybe advance to a Super Bowl, help Aaron Rodgers win one in the remaining few years of his career, the other thing they did was take a quarterback who is known for being sensitive, who is known for pouting a little bit, having issues with his coach at times, according to rumors, when Mike McCarthy was there, and put him in a situation where he's going to be looking over his shoulder. And GM Brian Gutekunst did not speak to Rodgers before drafting Love. Not that he's obligated to, but you think he should have, given the circumstances. And an unhappy Aaron Rodgers could be a big problem for the Green Bay Packers going forward. And the Packers spent the rest of the draft so far, rounds two and three, they add a running back and a tight end, again, not addressing wide receiver, offensive line, defense, a defensive line, inside linebacker, and cornerback, the positions that the team needed most. What Brian Gutekunst, the GM of the Packers, has done essentially with this draft is add players that second-year head coach Matt LaFleur thinks would be a good fit in his offense. Last year, LaFleur ran a hybrid of his offense and the Mike McCarthy system that Rodgers and the Packers had been running for the past 13 seasons. And it was moderately successful by adding a big physical running back and an H-back type tight end. These are kind of players that resemble Derrick Henry and Delaney Walker, two effective tools that LaFleur had when he was calling plays for the Tennessee Titans a couple of years ago. But these are not players who are going to contribute right away, who are going to help 
Aaron Rodgers take that next step toward a Super Bowl and a championship. So here's a team that seemed to be on the cusp of being able to win big. And instead of addressing their short-term needs, they go long-term. They go and give the head coach the type of players he wants for the long term. But depending on what they do today in day three of this draft, don't be surprised if the Packers take a little step back in 2020. Hopefully from a Packers standpoint to take steps forward in 2021. But this draft leaves a lot of Packer fans shaking their head. And that's not to say that the three players they picked weren't or won't become good football players and contributors. But from an overall perspective, from the way that this all played out, it left a lot more questions than answers for the Packers and their fans. And again, I expect that they will take a step back in 2020 unless the fact that this team is now in the second year of the running this offense will result in enough improvement to get them over that hump. All right, that's one of the beauties of this draft. You don't know what's going to happen. In all fairness, it takes at least three years before you could even have some perspective on which teams did well and which teams did poorly. But debating it is part of the beauty of being a sports fan. All right, that's going to do it for us. Stay safe, everybody. Keep that social distancing going. And we'll be back next week with more of the most compelling sports talk on the Internet. I'm Gil Martin. Thanks for listening to The Gil Martin Show. You've been listening to The Gil Martin Show with host Gil Martin. Tune in each week as Gil gives you an inside look into the world of sports with hard-hitting conversation on past and present sports figures from the writers, authors, and broadcasters right here on The Gil Martin Show. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company